Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you, Lord, that your grace is sufficient. And now, Lord, as we consider your word and your commandments, Father, help us to see our need of grace and to call out to you for that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this week there was a Dennis the Menace comic. Uh, Dennis and his friend Joey were walking down a, a freshly poured sidewalk with a big sign that said wet cement and the workman was looking at them askance, kind of, what are you boys doing? And Dennis looks up at the workman and he points at the sign and he said, well, it's okay, we're not wearing our good shoes. <laughs> Do we sometimes uh, excuse our wrongdoing? Do we misinterpret God's law and, and try to misapply it and we think, oh, it doesn't apply to me because, and, and how often do we have some excuse or, or we look for some sort of exception to God's law and uh, yet God's law still stands and it's still good and right and true and uh, sometimes we'll need to get educated as to how it applies and what it means in our lives. So we continue our series now on the Ten Commandments. This week we look at the Seventh Commandment, Thou shalt not steal. And that comes again from Exodus chapter 20 and, and verse 15. Very simple. Thou shalt not steal. And then we turn to the Catechism where we hear, what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not rob our neighbor of his money or property, nor bring them into our possession by unfair dealing or fraud, but help him improve and protect his property and living. We uh, see again here, as with the other commands, how the meaning expands from just not doing the item to not getting on the path that leads there and, and then also promoting the value that's represented there. Um, some, one person said as we uh, study the commands, it helps us see what God values and the priority because of the order of the commands. We begin with the value of life. Thou shalt not murder. And then we have the value of relationships and the value of faithfulness and do not commit adultery. And after that then comes the value of property. Do not steal. You know, uh, someone once uh, told me for witnessing, when you're sharing with someone and you want to help them understand their position before God, you can ask, you know, have you ever lied? And what do you call a person who lies? And they'll say, a liar. And, and have you ever committed adultery? What do you call someone who commits adultery? Well, they're an adulterer. And, and, you know, and we're not supposed to steal. What do you call someone who steals? And they'll come back and say, they're a stealer. And I'll say, no, that's a football player from Pittsburgh. But uh, uh, we, 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 we recognize that anyone who's broken any of the commands will, uh, is guilty of the whole law and guilty before God, and, and therefore uh, they need a Savior. And that's where these commands point us to. Again, the bottom line isn't where do we draw the line, the bottom line is what does it show us about ourselves? That we have a heart that is greedy and wants to take these shortcuts and disobey God's laws and find the excuses and the exceptions. And because of that, we need a savior. So we look at the meaning of this though. Uh, we should fear and love God so we do not rob our neighbor of his money or property. We see that obviously in outright theft. Um, we uh, 
recognize when that happens that you know, it should be repaid and things given back to their rightful owners. But Luther refers to what he called the swivel chair robbers, those who are styled as great noblemen and honorable pious citizens, and yet they rob and steal under a good pretext. They've always got an excuse. He, he lists several examples in the large catechism. He says there are servants who neglect or damage their master's property, are uh, stealing, in effect, from him. There are mechanics and workmen uh, who overcharge or are lazy and aren't working efficiently. We see uh, merchants with bad products that are presented as good products, or they have false weights or other tricks to draw money out of people for uh, giving them less value than they think they're getting. And and I think of the story of my dad's funeral. One of the workers came up to my mom and told a story about my dad, who was a foreman for a Cargill flax plant. And my dad, as foreman, came up to the worker one day, and he asked him, now, uh, did Cargill quit paying you? And the guy goes, no. And my dad asked him, well, then why did you quit working? <laughs> and... Uh, you know, we, we have that, what Luther again calls this swivel chair robbers who may lay in the background, but uh, uh, don't actually provide what's being called for in those situations. And so we're again told that meaning, do not, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we should so fear and love God that we do not rob our neighbor of his money or property or bring them into our possession by unfair dealing or fraud. We think of uh, unfair dealing and fraud, how uh, sometimes it's tempting when the market conditions shift to overcharge for something or take advantage. And uh, yet we read in James 5.4, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. And to see that by unfair dealing and fraud, we also steal. Reminds me of a a uh, regrettable incident in my younger days. I worked for a short time, just a few weeks, as a used car salesman. And one of the reasons I quit was the temptations that came my way when I noticed one day I was showing a car and it had the uh, air pressure pistons that held the trunk up and they were bad, so the trunk didn't stay up. But as I was opening it and showing the back of the car to the customer, I just leaned against it so they wouldn't see that it didn't stay up by itself. And, and I went home that day and, and felt so guilty. And, and I said, you know, if I'm putting myself in the place of that sort of temptation, that's probably not a good thing. And, and, and it wasn't too much afterwards I, I quit that job. But uh, we're tempted in that way, aren't we? We're tempted, unfair dealing and fraud to take advantage of some legal loophole or, or other uh, factor that might bring things our way or give us an advantage in our dealings. And, and we're told here, do not steal applies to those things too. Unfair dealing and fraud. And uh, then it goes on from there though, but rather help him improve and protect his property and living. See, there again, we see it's not just don't take it, but recognize the value of personal property and help our neighbor improve and protect the things he has. Uh, we read in Ephesians 4.28, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he might have something to share with anyone in need. Now Luther uses one word as key to this commandment. He says the key to this command is selflessness. 
putting the self aside, selflessness. And uh, he outlines several aspects of that. Uh, to seek my advantage to the disadvantage of others forgets the golden rule from Matthew 7, 12. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, so also do to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So if I'm putting my advantage ahead of someone else's advantage, I'm stealing from them and I'm forgetting that golden rule that we're called to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And so we can ask, is this the way I would want to be treated in this circumstance? And let that guide what we do. We also read uh, from Luther, Happy is the man who has not set his confidence in the treasure of money. Um, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. So often we look to uh, our stuff and the things of this world to provide us with security and protection and satisfaction. But God himself is the one we should look to for that. And as we, the, the more we look to the things of this world, the more we will find that they are empty and hollow and don't provide the security and satisfaction that we're looking for. Rather, we look to God. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And we put ourselves in a great place. I saw a comment this week on someone who mentioned their observation of how many millionaires are miserable and how many taxi drivers are happy and, and satisfied in life. That what we have isn't the measure of happiness, but with godliness, with contentment. We can be happy in any circumstance. We see Luther also talking of covetousness, which will show up in the ninth and 10th commands. Uh, covetousness shows most starkly that a man does not trust God for anything, but expects more benefit from his money than from God. Where do we expect the benefit in our life? Do we expect benefit from knowing God, or are we willing to sacrifice that for the benefits we think that money will bring us, and things and goods and stuff? So we, we see that really it's revealing our heart, that as we look to God, do we see him as a benefit in our life? Do we see him as a good and true and right God? Uh, as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. Do we think of God as the good guy or the bad guy? Do we think of him as holy and good and right and true? Or do we think of him as an oppressor that we have to work around to find our real happiness? And so we, we see how that reveals in us when we are covetous, it shows we do not trust God. And it calls us to know him better so we can trust him more. We see also, Luther again says, selflessness applies first and foremost to our enemies. It's easy to be selfless to friends, but the true test is how we treat opponents. A Christian must rise higher than the natural man. Uh, he says the natural man turns up his nose at God's commands. He wriggles out of them and turns away from them, but does the good works of his own choosing easily and gladly. We, we see how uh, it's really not a test to be kind and generous with someone we like, but it is a revealing of the heart when we can be kind and generous with someone we don't like and give them the benefit of the doubt and help them improve and protect their property and possessions. So we, we see that uh, it, it really shows not so much in how we treat our friends, but in how we treat those who might be against us. And then finally, one other word from Luther. In short, if you steal much, 
Depend on it that again as much will be stolen from you. God punishes one thief by means of another thief. Else, where, where would we find enough gallows and rope? There's not enough jails to imprison everybody doing wrong. But yet, you know, as the old saying, what goes around comes around. And uh, that the wealth gained by illicit means brings with it a curse. And it is soon gone and flitters away. And we wonder where it went. But that tells us in Proverbs that the wealth that God gives comes without a curse and comes with blessing because we look to the Lord and we trust in him and not in the things of this earth. And so as we uh, look through this, we, we need to look through and see past Satan's lies and deceptions. We, we see him with false promises like Proverbs 9.17, when the woman folly says to her victim, Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But then the next verse says, But he does not know that the dead are there, and her guests lie in the depths of the grave. Satan lies and says this is a solution. We see the hidden temptations. Uh, the partner in Proverbs 29, 24, the partner of a thief hates his own life. He hears the curse but discloses nothing. That when we go along with others doing wrong, we're going to bring harm to ourselves. We see also the judgment that comes from doing it. And, and yet there is suffering in life. 1 Peter 4:15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler, or some translations say a mischief maker. And, and you know, those will bring suffering. And, and just doing right, there's enough oppression and persecution of godly people without, when it's unjust, to not add the just persecution on top of it for things that deserve punishment. And so we're called here in, to put ourselves in the place to do good. Uh, again, from Ephesians 4.28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he might have something to share with anyone in need. See, when we trust in God, our focus can turn off of our own needs because God is our provider and protector. And therefore, we can make use of what he's given us to be generous and to provide for others in need, to help and protect them, keep and improve that which they have. And, and because we can look to God to provide us what we need. We're not looking to the things he's already given and holding on tight and then looking around for more. But as it says, thou shalt not steal. And again, what does this mean? We should fear and love God. As with all the commands, the meaning begins with our relationship with God. We fear and love God so that we do not rob our neighbor of his money or property, nor bring them into our possession by unfair dealing or fraud, but help him improve and protect his property and living. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your commands. We thank you for giving us greater understanding and seeing how they can apply. And Lord, we pray that you would give us a heart that fears and loves you. And so it leads us to walk in your ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.